That's to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 7, reading the first three verses. I want particularly to deal with that third verse this evening. The God of glory who appeared unto Abraham in Mesopotamia said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Now these words, as most of you will recall, were uttered and spoken by this first Christian martyr, Stephen, who was on trial before the great court, the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem, not only because he was a Christian, but because he was also a preacher of the gospel. They were charging him with blasphemy. They were charging him with speaking against the temple. And above all, they were charging him with exhorting people to believe in this Jesus of Nazareth, who not long before had been crucified on a tree outside Jerusalem on a hill called Calvary, and whose dead body had been taken and placed in a grave, but who, according to these preachers, had risen from the dead, and having manifested himself for forty days unto certain people, had ascended in the presence of some of them into heaven, and there he is, they said, seated at the right hand of God, waiting until his enemies shall be made his footstool. Now Stephen is on trial, and this is the beginning of his reply to these charges that are brought against him. The high priest says, are these things so? And this is Stephen's answer. Takes them back into history. Takes them back to the beginning of their story as Jews, as Israelites. And uh, tells them and reminds them of that which happened to their father Abraham. Now, this in other words, you see, is the answer of the Christian church tonight to this question that the world in its confusion is putting to the Christian church. What, how do you justify yourselves? What have you got to say? We might very well consider that question this evening. Here we are in this modern world of ours. We are well aware of its condition. This is Remembrance Sunday. We are remembering in particular two world wars. We've had two of them already in this one century. Men have been killing themselves by them, one another by the million. They've invented all sorts and kinds of instruments of destruction. Human ingenuity and ability has been directed in this century mainly to the art of destruction. Two world wars. We see the present state of affairs and we see certain dread possibilities appearing on the horizon. And people may ask, what's the Christian church got to say to all this? This old institution that's been going nearly 2,000 years, is it only an anachronism in the modern world, or is it something vital, something concrete, something definite to say? Have we a message this night which is unique? Have we something to say to men and women in their trouble and in their distress? Well, I suggest we have. That's why I'm here. That's why we're all here, because of this message. What is this message? Well, here it is. Stephen puts it clearly. Here's a report of the longest report we've come across so far in the book of the Acts of the Apostles of a sermon delivered by one of these early Christian leaders. And what is the message? Well, we've been looking at it several Sunday nights. What we found is this. That this world, after all, is God's world, not man's. Man's invented many things, but he hasn't invented the world. Man can make many things, but he can't make a universe. He's trying to discover a little bit more about it, but it's still the mysterious universe. It's God's world, the God of glory, the God of creation. He's at the back of all. You've got to start by realizing it. That's where the gospel starts. Here it is presented by this man Stephen, the God of glory. If you don't start there, you're bound to be wrong. If you start with men, you're already wrong. Man isn't big enough to explain his own universe. Can't even explain himself. It's God's world. But thank God the message tells us further that God is concerned about this world. The God of glory appeared unto Abraham. Came down, as it were, and spoke to him. Gave him a message. Now this is the essence of the Christian gospel. That God is not only concerned about this world, but that he has a great plan for it. He has a great purpose. It is a plan and a purpose of redemption. 
God is reconciling the world unto himself. That's the message. Man must sin, brought down misery and unhappiness upon himself, and he can't extricate himself out of it. His only hope lies in that God should do something about it, and God has done. This God of glory has appeared unto Abraham. But above all, as we've been seeing, he has appeared in the person of his only begotten Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is the center of this message. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. The center of the message is what we were dealing with last Sunday night, the cross on Calvary's hill. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now here is the great message. And this is the message of the Christian church this very night. That God has already done something in Jesus Christ, his son. He's done everything that is necessary for us to be reconciled unto him and to be delivered out of this present evil world. That's the message. Now, the question that people put at this point is this. Very well, if that is true, how does it come to us? How does this message come to us? Another way I can put that tonight is this. What has the gospel got to say to us on this Remembrance Sunday evening? What is this proposal it makes? What is this announcement that it makes? What is this hope that it holds out before us? How does all this come to us? Now that's the great question. And still, Stephen answers it. You really have got a summary of the gospel here. And that's why I'm dealing with it in detail. People are asking, what is the Christian message? What is the Christian gospel? I'm not surprised they're asking that. The voices that are speaking to them are such confused voices. But here is the authentic answer, and I know nothing apart from this. I'm simply expounding this to you and holding it before you and for your consideration. How does it come to us? Well, the answer is this. It comes to us in the form of a call. God calls us. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon, and he said unto him, Get thee out, come. It's a call. Now here is the thing that we've got to grasp about this great message. It is God speaking to us. And he speaks to us in terms of a call. How does he do so? Now, here is something that is dealt with in the Bible at great length. Because this is God's way of dealing with men. He calls us. But he's got many, many ways of doing so. And it's very important that we should realize that. It's one way, of course. The ordained way above all others is what I'm trying to do at this present moment. And that is through preaching. Now, the Apostle Paul again puts that like this, you see. He says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And so on. Now here is the way above all other ways through which God, throughout the running centuries, has called men and women into this great salvation that he has provided for us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, supremely by his death. And that is why we preach. How should they preach except they be sent? That means, how can a man preach unless God has called him to preach and given him a message and given him power to preach? Now, this is the biblical teaching. And that is why we still do this. I'm not here because of a profession. I'm here because God has called me to deliver this message. It's his message. And I wouldn't dare preach it unless I was certain that he'd called me to do so. This is one way. But it's only one. Many men have been called, many people have been called through listening to preaching, exposition of the scriptures, the message of salvation as expanded by human lips. But sometimes it happens by reading. Many a man has heard this call and has responded to it by reading the Bible. 
Nobody was with him. He was reading the Bible alone and God spoke to him. He knew the word was to him. Something happened and the word stood out. He may have read it many a time before, but he'd never seen anything in it. Suddenly it stands out in letters of gold. And God, he knows, is speaking to him. Well, not only reading the Bible. It can happen sometimes when men is reading literature. Oh, I could keep you at great length in telling you the different ways in which God has called men and women to face these great and ultimate realities. Some men say that it came to them through viewing a wonderful landscape, something terrific in nature, which made them think of God. These are some of the ways. Then another very common one, of course, is illness. There have been many a man who's thanked God for an illness as he looks back across his life. Why? Well, because when he was well, he never thought about these things at all. He just went on day after day, the routine of life, round and round it went, and he was thoughtless. Suddenly he's laid on his back by a serious illness, and the illness made him think, and he thanks God for the illness. I may have quoted to you before, one of the greatest preachers of Scotland, Certainly one of the greatest preachers last century, Dr. Thomas Chalmers, always testified that he owed his understanding of the way of salvation to a serious illness that put him on his back for ten months. Illness. Oh, many a man has heard this called through an accident. I remember hearing the story of an old preacher called Thomas Gray. How did he ever become a, cre a preacher? Well, his story in its essence was this. He was living a very dissolute and evil life. He was a miner working in a mine, drinking, gambling, cursing, utterly heedless and thoughtless. There was a terrible accident in the mine, and a number of men had been killed. And this man, Thomas Gray, was one of those who were saved, and he was walking along the road, and an old preacher mess met him, and he said, Thomas Gray, he said, I thought you were in hell since yesterday. And that awakened him and made him think, the accident. And then, of course, death. Somebody else's death, I mean. Standing over an open grave. Death visiting a family or home. This has often been the one means of awakening people. You remember the famous story told by D.L. Moody. I mention it simply to illustrate this point. A father and mother came to him. Their only child had died. And they were bitter. And they went to him and said, you say God is a God of love? How can God be a God of love when he takes our only child from us like this? Moody knew their story, that they were people who were only very nominally godly, godly people and Christians. They were not really godly nor Christian at all. Put up an appearance of religion. So he told them a story. He told them of how once he had watched a shepherd trying to drive a sheep and a lamb across a little brook. And just each time as he thought he'd got them across, they'd turn round and they'd run away again. And he'd been at it for hours. Suddenly he had an idea. He caught the lamb. And he just carried the lamb across the brook. And the sheep followed without any difficulty whatsoever. And Moody applied the story and they saw it. God calls like that sometimes. Very difficult, very grieving, heartbreaking. But you see, the love of God is so great that if you don't come in answer to his appeals to the word as it is preached, it may be necessary to do something like that. And then on a day like this, we think of war, don't we? Calamities, wars, all that goes with war. The breakdown of everything that we trusted to. The whole of life in a turmoil. And this makes people think, makes them face the great questions of life and death and eternity. Now these, I'm simply giving you illustrations of the ways in which the call of God may come to a man. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham and he called him. Those are some of the ways in which God calls us. Remembrance Sunday. Is God calling somebody in this congregation? Has he brought you here tonight through this day? He's often done things like that. He's still doing it, thank God. Well, here may be one of the ways in which God is calling somebody tonight to think and to consider and to meditate about these things, the vital things, the ultimate questions. 
The second point I notice in this record is this, that it is always a personal call. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. He appeared to an individual. He didn't call a nation, didn't call a family. He called one man, an individual person. And I want to emphasize this, because of all things that is being forgotten at the present time, it is this, the importance of the individual. Now, I needn't waste your time in reminding you how the individual is being forgotten and ignored in almost every realm and department of life. I could say a good deal about that. That's not my province. That's not my business directly. But when you come to this realm, it is really of the most vital and urgent importance. There is a tendency even in the church today to put the emphasis on the social and the general rather than on the individual. There are people who don't hesitate to say that the day of the old individual gospel and appeal to the individual is gone that you can only appeal to the modern men through social conditions, through politics, through putting the world right. They say he's not interested, he's no longer selfish, he's no longer concerned in his own little soul. But he is interested in conditions, he's interested in world affairs, he's interested in these big movements amongst men and masses of people. All right, I know that is the emphasis and that is the tendency. And all I've got to say is that that isn't the biblical method. It isn't God's method. God deals with the individual. He doesn't start with the social conditions. He doesn't start with the general conditions. The gospel is not primarily a general message. It is ultimately a general message, but primarily it is always an individual message. The God of glory who has made the universe and who sustains the cosmos he appeared unto one man, Abraham, and spoke to him directly, personally, and alone. And that, my dear friends, is a thing that I am emphasizing tonight. Did you come to this service expecting me to give a political review of this present century? Did you come here tonight expecting me to deliver a pompous opinion? as to the present state of affairs and what I think prime ministers and governments and presidents and others should be doing. Did you think that that is the message of the gospel? That it's a protest against conditions as they are? That I'm here to call you to rise up in a great movement to put an end to armaments or war or something like that? That's not the gospel. I am here, my dear friend, to speak to you. You are not responsible for world conditions, neither am I. But there is something for which you are responsible and for which you will be held responsible at the eternal bar of judgment. You and I will not be questioned on the politics of the 20th century, but you'll be questioned about your own soul and what you've done with it. That'll be the question to you. Every man shall bear his own burden. Every man has got to answer for himself. Now... This, you see, is the invariable rule in the Bible, and it has been the invariable rule throughout the history of the Christian church. What I mean is this. Isn't it interesting to observe that it is in the eras and the periods when the church has preached this personal individual message that the church has always had the greatest influence upon social and political conditions? The greatest periods in the history of this country and other countries have always been the periods that have followed the great religious revivals and reawakenings, when the emphasis has been upon personal salvation. When you get a large number of individuals changed and becoming children of God, they in turn begin to deal with the social conditions. But in this present century, when the church has been talking chiefly and mainly about social and political conditions, you see what's happening. Not only are the individuals becoming ever smaller and smaller in number and in aggregate and the church is dwindling until she's a mere remnant in society, but the whole level of your society is falling and degenerating and the church counts less than she's done for many a century in this country. You see, the whole thing is wrong. It is a personal message. 
I'm therefore not here to ask you tonight what your opinion of war is, nor what you think of the government, nor what you think of armaments, nor what you think ought to be done. I'm here to ask you a question, and the question is this. What about you? What are you making of it? It's easier to criticize governments than to criticize yourself. Governments are failures, you say. All right, are you a success? The question is a personal one to you. In Mesopotamia, just where you are, the God of glory comes and speaks to you directly and immediately, and it's about yourself. Very well, the next point I notice is this. It is a call to us to leave an old way of life. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia and said unto him, Get thee out, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Get thee out. Leave your country, leave your family, leave your kindred. Now this is most important. This is the first part of the call of the gospel always. Get out. Leave. Flee. Get thee out. Leave your country, leave your kindred. What does this mean? Well, you see, what it meant to Abram was this. There he was. He'd been brought up in that country. There was a great background. His family had been there before him for many generations. You know, the typical background of life. And he's called to come out of it. That being interpreted for us today means that the first call of the gospel is always to us to leave a worldly view of life. Abram, as I reminded you several Sundays back, was a pagan in Mesopotamia. They were all pagans there, worshipping sun and moon and stars and so on, particularly moon worshippers. Uh, there they were. It, it was, that was the background of the country and his kindred and his family, and he was one of them, belonged to them, brought up amongst them. That was his ancestry. He was an essential part of that sort of life. He's called to come out of it. This is always the first call of the gospel. Now, if you want to know what I mean when I say that you must leave and come out of a worldly view of life, well, let the Apostle John define that for us. This is how he describes it. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's it. That's the life of the world. That's the kind of life that Abraham was called out of. There are many other descriptions of it. The Apostle Paul puts it at the beginning of the second chapter of his epistle to the Ephesians, you remember. You were he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's the life of the world. That was the life that Abram was living, the life of Mesopotamia, the life of Great Britain, the life of America, the life of all countries and nations, country and kindred. Ah, oh, it's an outlook, you see, which is only interested in this world, this life, nothing beyond it. A life which is interested in country, what happens in it, and kindred, family, pride of men, earthly glory, all oh, the world is full of it, especially on a day like this. That's the extent to which it goes. So you read the biographies again, and there are new books out on the wars, and how they happened, the preliminaries, what led to them, how you explain them, how they were won or lost, here it is, this world only, never anything beyond entirely confined to this present world in which we find ourselves. And, of course, the natural man, the man who isn't the Christian Abraham as he was in Mesopotamia, you settle down in this world. You eat and drink, you do your work, take up a profession, you get married, have children, and round and round it goes. It's always been like that, it always will be like this. This is the tradition that we've inherited, and this is the tradition that we pass on. It's a repetition of the same old story from generation to generation. Country, 
history of your country, kindred, family, history of your family. And it's just a repetition. It goes on and on and on. It's always the same. Birth, marriages, deaths. There's the end. We come, we go. Round and round in the circle. The course of this world, the Apostle Paul describes it. The essential and eternal merry-go-round of life, just going round and round tradition. But unfortunately, that isn't all we say about it. You notice these descriptions that are given of it? It's a life of lust and a life of desire. Lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. Now, the call of God, you see, is a call to us to get out of this sort of thing. We're all in it by nature. We're all born into this. This is what we inherit. We listen to older people when we are children. We listen to their stories, stories of what they've seen and heard and known and done and what others have done before them. And we drop into it and we go on repeating it and we pass it on. And here it is. And it's a life that is controlled by the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Why do we do this? Well, the answer in the Bible is it's the devil that controls it all and makes us do it. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's a life that doesn't include God. God is not in our thoughts. Well, we worship other things as they worship the moon in Mesopotamia. We worship money. We worship motor cars. We worship houses. We worship pleasure. We worship one another. But it's the same thing. It's all animal. It's all instinctual. It's all primitive. It's all this world, and it's all, I say, belonging mainly to the realm of the body. This is the kind of life we all inherit. We all come into it. It hasn't changed at all. It was true in Mesopotamia. It is still true. And in addition to all that, it is a life of false hopes. This is the most tragic aspect of it all. It's a life of trouble. It's a life of failure. It's a life which has to have remembrance days. And there are remembrances of wars, and of suffering, and of bloodshed, and of pain, and of horror. And the world is troubled by this from time to time. These special days make us think of it for a while, and we are uncomfortable then. Of course, we forget it until the next one comes round next year. But for the time being, we're a little bit put out and a little bit troubled, and some take it more seriously than others, and they say, we've got to put things right. We can't go on like this. We really must put a stop to this. And so they believe that they can do so. Indeed, there are some who even believe that it's already happening, that the world is advancing, that the world is developing. But the world always believes in the possibility of change. It always believes that things can be put right, that they can be made better. So it very often uses a day like this to exhort itself, to pull itself up, and to make a better world, to get rid of war and all these horrors, the things that ruin life and rarely make a new land. The world is always persuading itself that this can be done. Some of us here tonight are old enough to remember a very eloquent man telling us in the First World War, 50 years ago, that we were fighting this war, what for? To have a land fit for heroes to live in. And we believed it, at least most did. He put it like that. And we're all rather fond of singing Blake's Jerusalem, aren't we? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. Oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. We rather like singing that, don't we? The words are wonderful, good poetry. Sir Hubert Perry's tune is perhaps even better. But what of it? Rubbish and nonsense. Rubbish and nonsense. But we believe we can do it. We believe we are capable of doing it. We can improve the conditions. We can deal with our problems and our situation. We are going to bring the new Jerusalem in through acts of parliament and in various other ways. But what God says to us is this, get out, get out. Why? Well, because this is a land of sin and woe. 
because we are living in the city of destruction. Well, John Bunyan, he saw it, didn't he? Have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Well, if you haven't, read it. It's got more to say to this present generation than all your Sunday newspapers and their brilliant articles put together. Pilgrim's Progress. How does it begin? Well, there's a man living in a place called the City of Destruction. And a call came to him to get out, to flee for his life, to flee from the City of Destruction. According to the Bible, this world is the City of Destruction. There'll never be a new Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land as the result of men's actions and activities. The plain truth that we are told is this, that Mesopotamia, England, anywhere you like, is under the wrath of God. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Christian message says to the world tonight. We are under the wrath of God, my friends. Why have we had these two world wars? Why are things as they are? According to this teaching, it is a part of God's punishment of our sin and rebellion against him. He is allowing us to reap what we ourselves have sown. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you start worshipping men, you'll soon be killing him. If you say you can get on without God, your life will be a chaos. And the world is proving it. It's a part of our punishment. We are in the city of destruction. We are all by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The wrath of God from heaven is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. My dear friend, whether you and I like this or not, such is the message of this gospel. The God of glory appeared to Abram. This is the beginning of this great story in a sense of redemption. The covenant that God made with Abram. But the first move was this. Get out, come out, leave where you are. You're in the city of destruction. Flee, come. The judgment of God. Now, if you really are anxious to understand the state of your world and why things are tonight... I suggest to you that that is the only adequate explanation. Go and ask your philosophers to explain it. They can't. Go and ask your believers in politics. And I'm not here to say that you don't need philosophy and politics and education. Of course you do. We need all these things. But what I'm saying is this, that if you pin your faith in them, as men so foolishly do, who don't pin their faith in God, well, your world will get worse and worse. But you haven't got an explanation even. The world in this 20th century is falsifying all the teachings and the prophesyings of the idealists, those confident people of the last century and after that. No, no. This world is under the wrath of God. It's under condemnation. And my dear friend, I'm speaking to you as an individual. Your immediate problem and mine is this. Not what's going to happen to the world. Is there going to be another war? I don't know and you don't know. And I'm wasting your time if I try to prophesy. But what I do know is this. That whether there's another world war or not, that you and I have got to die. And we've got to stand before God in the judgment. And he will look at us as men and as women and as souls. And he'll tell us what he gave us at the beginning. And he'll ask us what we've made of it. We'll stand in the light of his holy law and his eternal judgment. And here he's already told us, we are already under condemnation. The whole world lieth guilty before God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So the message is, get out, get out. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Those were the words used by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem when he preached the first Christian sermon. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Judgment is coming upon the world. And if you don't get out of its outlook and its mentality, you'll be involved in its judgment. And it is eternal judgment. Misery and unhappiness outside the life of God. Get thee out. Separate yourself from it. But thank God it doesn't stop at the negative. You notice the other side. Get thee out from thy country and from thy kindred. And come, come into the land which I shall show thee. This is a perfect statement of the gospel. The law, the gospel. The command to get out, to repent, 
the gracious invitation, come, come into the land which I shall show thee. Oh, thank God for this. God is not only announcing and pronouncing judgment upon us and upon our world is issuing to us tonight a gracious invitation. Is your heart tender because you're thinking of some loved one? Is your heart tender because you're thinking of some calamity? Because you're thinking of one of these wars and all it's meant to you and your family and your life? Is your heart tender? Well, listen, can you hear whispering in that the call of God saying to you, Come! He's calling you to himself. And what's he calling you to? He's calling you to a complete change. Come out of Mesopotamia. Come out of all it represents. Leave your country. Leave your kindred. Come out. Come to the place that I have prepared for you. What is this? What's it mean? Well, put in modern language and in modern terms, it's this. He calls us to an entirely new outlook. Oh, I do want to emphasize this. The Christian life is a life that's altogether different from the other life. There's nothing in common. They're entirely different. It's a complete change. It's a translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, the kingdom of light. What's it mean? Well, I say it means an entirely new way of thinking, an entirely new outlook. How does this man now think, the Christian man? You see, the other man, he thought in terms of country and of kindred. It all revolves around that, this world and its history, his own particular bit of history and particular country and kindred. Oh, that's not the view of this man. This man, he's called out now to a new life. And this is a life that starts not with country and kindred, but with the soul. Myself. I'm an individual. I'm a being. I'm an entity. I came into this world alone. The heart knows its, its, its own bitterness. And I know that I shall have to die alone. I'm isolated. I am alone. Very well. I'm told, release yourself. Don't be tied up and involved thoughtlessly in what's happening to the whole, the mass. You yourself. What are you? And I made to realize that I'm a soul face to face with God. And that the most important thing for me in this life tonight is not what's going to happen to society or the whole world, but what's going to happen to me. Myself, my soul, and my eternal destiny. I have a feeling within me that dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Every man has a feeling of immortality and is right. Death is not the end, you go on. What of this soul then? This is the new way of thinking. I myself as a responsible being before God. So I realize that the most important thing for me in this world is my relationship to God. Now this is the essence of this message. I must put my relationship to God before my relationship to men. That's the fallacy, the fallacy of this 20th century. Social conditions, politics, the mass. No, no, you start with God. Our Lord has made this plain once and forever. He was asked one day, which is the first and the greatest commandment, yet this was his answer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. This is the first and the chiefest commandment. The second is like unto it. But it's only the second. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's no use saying, as the modern man is saying, I don't care about God. It's my fellow men. How do I get on with my fellow men? That's what I want to get settled. You will never settle it until you're right with God. For all men who are not right with God can never be right with one another. They're all gods, and they're filled with selfishness and self-centeredness, and they will fight as they always have fought. There is only one way to reconcile men with men, and that is that both be reconciled to God first. It's the only way. This is the new way of thinking. Get thee out. Make sure that you are right. Get your heart right. Get your outlook right. Start with yourself. Not society, but you. And then it goes on, of course, to tell me this. That this life of mine is only a preparation for what is coming. Get out from your country and your kindred. 
Country and kindred think of this life only, as I've been telling you, human history. And they glory in it or criticize it. It doesn't matter which, but it's always this. No, no, says this. You are nothing but strangers and pilgrims in this world. You are nothing but journeymen. You are simply passing through this world. It's a great world, and we should make the best of it while we are here. But it isn't the only world. It's only a preparation. It's a preparatory school. We are on our way. There lies ahead of us the great reality. That's the thing. Get out. Come. Yeah, do you realize that? That your life in this world is only a preparation for the great life that is yet to come. It's the teaching of the whole Bible. Didn't you see it there in that 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, a part of which I read to you at the beginning? But let me end on this great note. It is an outlook and a teaching that gives us a new hope. And this is the message on an armistice night as Remembrance Sunday, such as this. A new hope. I make bold to say this, that there is literally no hope in this world tonight apart from the hope that is given in this message. None at all. But, oh, says somebody, that's no good. You are preachers. You've been saying that throughout the centuries, and yet look at your world tonight. Is your hope, the hope of your gospel, any better than the hope of the politicians and the philosophers and the poets? Is it any better? Ah, yes, it is, but you must be quite quite clear as to what it is. People are outside the church tonight because they say the church has failed. They say the promises of the gospel have not been verified. You know the popular argument? Your gospel has been preached now for nearly 2,000 years, and yet look at the world as you've described it. Your Christianity has failed. That's what they say. But they say that because they don't understand the message of Christianity. They think the message of Christianity is world reform, making the world a better and a better place, passing acts of parliament, doing social and political good, and gradually you're transforming society and changing the whole of your world. But that is never the message of the gospel. As I've already told you, the message of the gospel is that this world is the city of destruction. Our Lord himself said that there shall be wars and rumors of wars to the end of time. He paints a very terrible picture of the end of this age. He doesn't promise a gradual and increasing reform and improvement. Quite the reverse. No, no, that's not the message of the gospel. The gospel has never said that it is going to build the new Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land because it knows that it's never going to be done. You can call for your swords. You can call for your spears. You can talk about your mental strife and you'll die a complete failure. The gospel has never promised that. Well, what does it promise? Well, you see, what it promises is this. The thing that kept Abraham going, we are told in that 11th of Hebrews. He was looking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was looking for a city not produced by men and his ideas, not based on men and his intelligence and his learning and his science and his knowledge. No, no. Builder and maker is God. God's the architect. God's the builder. It's God who's doing it. Not man and his activity, but God's great plan and God's work. He's working, he's calling, he's moving, he's carrying it along. This is the message. Whose builder and maker is God. Well, what is this message? I say it isn't the message of worldly reform. Well, what is it? Oh, it's that great message that I read to you just now out of the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. It's the heavenly city. It's the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's the city of God. All things made new. New heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's the message. And it is the only hope for the world tonight. Did you notice its wonderful characteristics? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You see, there's no hope for this present one. But there's going to be a new one. 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared for a, as a bride adorned for her husband. Not you and I building it by our efforts and exertions and our mental strife. All the nonsense that men, poets and politicians, have fooled us with throughout the centuries. No, no. It comes down from heaven, from God. He's made it. He's fashioned it. It's absolutely perfect. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. O oh, mourners, Oh, those of you who have come here with a broken heart on this remembrance Sunday night, listen. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. The new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The city of God descending, God sending it down after the judgment of this evil world and all who belong to it and its evil ways, all the dupes and the serfs of Satan. That's the message. Abraham was looking for a city that hath foundations. Whose builder and maker is God. Do you notice how this man puts it? They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is unheavenly. You see, it isn't this world. It's the world that is to come. This is the message of the Bible. This old world of ours will go on plunging from war to war, from calamity to calamity, in spite of all your optimists, all your idealists, all your politicians and all the rest of them. They will never build a new Jerusalem. Never. It is impossible because of the sin in the heart of men. This world is under judgment and it is certain to be judged. These things are absolute certainties. The Christ of God, who having risen from the dead, having conquered death in the grave, and having manifested himself unto his chosen witnesses, ascended unto heaven, has taken his seat at the right hand of God in the glory everlasting, and he is waiting until his enemies shall be made his footstool. But my friends, he is coming again. He will come back. He's going to come to destroy all his enemies. Sin and evil and all the effects of it will be purged out of the universe and the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven and he'll reign from shore to shore. There'll be no need of a sun. He'll be the light of it. This is coming. This is as certain as we're in this building tonight. And the great question, therefore, for you and for me and for all of us is this. Will you be in that city? The only thing that matters. You'll soon be out of this earthly city, if not by war, by old age, by death, accident, illness, sickness. You'll have to leave this city. But the question I'm asking you is where you're going to spend your eternity. Will you be in the city of God, this heavenly city, this new Jerusalem, this paradise of God, this renovated cosmos, which is certainly coming? Will you be in it? That's the question. I say it at the risk of being misunderstood. It is a comparatively unimportant question as to whether there's going to be another world war or not. This is the question. Not what happens to you in time, but what happens to you in eternity. Will you be a member of this city, a citizen of this city of God? Here's the message. You decide that now. You decide that in this world. And the call of God is a call to you to come out, to get out of the city of destruction, the city that is under his wrath. 
and become a member of this new community, become a citizen of this new kingdom. You can enter it in the here and now. How do you do so? Well, you do it by believing God's message. You listen to what he tells you to do. Get out! Come! Have you got out? Have you left the world and its way and its mind and its evil outlook? Have you seen it for what it is? And have you, like Bunyan's pilgrim, left it, leaving country, kindred, everybody? You're a soul yourself, and you've got to answer, and you've got to bear the consequences. Have you heard the command, get out, free from the wrath to come, save yourselves from this untoward generation? And have you heard his gentle call saying to you, come? In spite of all you've been until this hour, come, I'm preparing a city. Come into my kingdom. Come out of the darkness into my marvelous light. Come out of a land of sin and woe into a land of pure delights where saints immortal reign. Have you heard this call? It's a personal one. Stop thinking about what's going to happen to the world. What's going to happen to you? That's the question. You can be saved out of this present evil world. You can become a citizen of the kingdom of God tonight. He's calling you. He's inviting you. He's urging you. He's telling you of what he's prepared for you. Come, he said to Abraham of old, out of thy country and thy kindred. Come into the land which I shall show thee. He's got it ready, waiting for him. Here is the kingdom of God waiting for you. Have you heard this call? Have you obeyed it? Have you accepted this invitation? Oh, yes, it'll cost you. It'll mean leaving the world and its outlook. Our Lord put it like this. Enter in, he said, at the straight gate. Come, he says, unto the narrow way. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. They're crowding through it tonight. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. If you hear his injunction and accept and obey his call, the world will laugh at you. It'll, it'll ridicule. It'll say you've become narrow, that you become a fool, that you become a psychological case. Let them say what they like. Let them go on along the broad way that leadeth to destruction, that leadeth to the modern world, which is but a pale shadow of what hell will be. Let them boast, let them go on, cursing, laughing, drinking, damning and jeering. It leadeth to destruction. Come through the straight gate unto the narrow way. Say to him tonight, if you've never said it before, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken all to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, forsaken. Thou from hence my all shalt be. Perish every fond ambition, ambition. That's it. That's the life of this world, ambition. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought and hoped and known. Perish the lot. Yet, how rich is my condition, God and heaven are still mine own. Oh, my dear friend, have you heard the call, this remembrance Sunday night? Get out! Get out! While there's still time, escape. And come, become a citizen of the kingdom that shall last forever and forever, that can never be removed, the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. 
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.